welcome to Church Experience Online. We're so happy you joined us today. As you watch this teaching video, if you have any questions or need help getting connected, please don't hesitate to reach out by phone or email. Also, our website is the best place to go if you'd like to access helpful Grow Step resources, join a serving team, connect in a life group, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially by giving online. At the end of this teaching video, you'll hear one of our Church Experience Worship original songs, and we hope this gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you've learned. Thanks again for joining us at Church Experience Online. He is taking a chance and on this one. Thank you. Um, so in the church I'm pastoring out up in Indiana, I, we have a theme this year, and it's called Raise the Bar, and that's kind of where I want to challenge you this morning. And the goal is to get at the end of this year, 2020, and know that we have either gotten to know God a little bit better or we've moved closer to them. So when I think about that, I start asking questions in my life. You know, how does that happen? And um, we go through life with all kinds of questions to kind of move us to the next stage. Is it okay with you all if I tell a story or two about Brandon? Is that... Um, <clears throat> Brandon and Jennifer, and Brandon is a good son-in-law. I... I um, I couldn't be prouder of him and the work he does and Jennifer and they work together. I like their kids, have a lot of fun when we get together. And, um, and it is fun. And we kind of are, are cutting back and forth on each other all the time between uh, Brandon and the other brother-in-law and my son. And so one of the first times I remember having some questions connected with Brandon was um, he had earlier in the week asked uh, when we were out in California, he said, <clears throat> could I take you and Rita, my wife, out to eat for breakfast, um, and I'll pay for it. Now, um, he was going to ask if he could marry Jennifer, uh, the purpose of it. But I'm starting to ask questions, because if I'm going to get up, I'm not going to do it on Saturday morning. That's my one morning, if I'm going to sleep in. So we asked on Saturday morning. And uh, then he asked if I want to go out to breakfast. Now, I'm not a breakfast person. Breakfast for me is a Mountain Dew and vitamins. I mean, that's just kind of like the way I start. Maybe a protein drink when I'm leaving or something, but I'm just not a breakfast person. And then he says, and I'll pay for it. Now, it's not like they're synonymous, Brandon, and I'll pay for it. Uh, he's, he's good with his money, not super tight, but that, that was an unexpected. So my wife and I are out, and we're in, we're in a, uh, a little restaurant, and it probably is about as big as this stage here, seating area, tables all over. There were probably uh, six, eight tables that had somebody at them, uh, two, four people. And um, so we're sitting in there, <coughs> and Brandon asks if uh, he can marry Jennifer. My wife is uh, excited, and I'm thinking... It just can't be this easy for Brandon. I, I, I don't want to make it this easy. And so I look around the room, and I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody that's sitting at any of the other tables. I don't go out to breakfast. It's just, and so there are probably eight or ten places where there's somebody at a table. So I stood up, and, and I said, excuse me for just a minute. And I said, this gentleman right here is asking if he can marry my daughter, if if this gentleman that's sitting right here would ask to marry your daughter, would you say yes or no? <clears throat> and uh, a couple people go, yes, and a couple people clap, and, and then there's a, just a big group of people that are just kind of like <laughs> trying to figure this thing out. And, and, and I've, for the longest time, thought they're trying to figure out, I wonder what kind of a guy he is. And literally, when I'm getting some of the notes to bring down here, 
I'm thinking, and I'd never thought this before, I thought maybe they're thinking, why would he want to marry into a family that would make me his father-in-law, that, that would do something like that in a restaurant? And uh, so we go home, and, and it's, it, it's, it's the kind of thing, and I've always wanted to have it this way, where the daughters, sons, son-in-laws, daughter-in-laws, we can always joke, we can kid with each other, we can rip, we can cut and do things like that on different things. And a couple of years ago, we were playing a game, and I do not remember the name of this game, but it was the question you had to answer was something like, what do you wish you could do or control in life. And we're always trying to think of something that would make the other person laugh, come up with something really novel, something. And so, um, you know, when, when you know somebody thinks they've got something good, they'll start giggling, they'll start laughing. I can hear, I can see Brandon laughing uh, on this one. And so you go around and you read or you listen to what everybody says. And Brandon's answer for, what do I wish I could do or control in life? He said, I wish I could have power of attorney when my father-in-law gets old. <laughs> and I, I, that haunts me. Uh, I am going to live off the grid when I get to that place there. I mean, all I can think of is somebody from the nursing home saying, Brandon, uh, dad messed the bed again. What do you want us to do with it? And Brandon saying something like, Teach him a lesson, just leave him there for a couple of days, call me back, see how he's doing, and we'll make a decision then. And, I mean, I don't know how drastic he would get, but I, I never know. But anyway, we have a lot of fun together. I enjoy being down here. It's been cloudy, it's been a little bit rainy, and it was sunny this morning. Literally, almost every time I've been to Florida, that's the way it is. It's kind of like Florida says, we don't like it when you're here, you're going, the sun comes out. That's just kind of our message, that's the clue. It's time for you to go at this point. But anyway, have enjoyed it. I love Florida. It's a great place. And I know they're doing a good job, and I know that you love them. And uh, so let me just uh, challenge you. I, I lost my voice a couple times in the first service, so thank you for thinking of that. Um, I have just a tiny bit in here, so I... <laughs> I'll get around to it. Um, I want to ask you some questions, and, and I, I just want you to think this way. At the end of the service, I'm going to say, what is one or what are two ways that you could say, this is a goal, whether it's small or big, that I could make for myself that will help me to get to know God better or move me closer to him? So I have three questions. The first question that is really important to me is, how big is the God that you believe in? In the beginning of the Bible, the first verse is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, uh, which says he was before everything, and he had the ability to make everything. When I was in college, I really wrestled with the whole idea of evolution. And uh, I would buy a book, and, and I'm trying to figure this thing out. You know, this has to be able to make sense if evolution has some truth to it, but God created everything. How, how do these pieces fit together? And I literally would buy a book and, and kind of read through it, and it would explain how some of the fossils lead to this being very close to this or this having uh, a very close relationship enough so you could see how one could go to the other. And I finally got to the place because it just kept getting more and more frustrating to try and fit it together where I had to say to myself, <clears throat> is my God big enough to create something even if I don't understand it all? And I had to come to that place. And uh, when I settled that in my mind, in our society, the way that we learn is we don't believe it unless you can prove it. And so it makes it hard for us sometimes to believe in a big God. But God will always take you to the edge of what you believe about him. And then when you are comfortable there, he'll push you out of that just a little bit more. It's kind of like somebody who dives. Uh, your coach, if you're a... a Somebody who dies will always work on another twist or another turn, another somersault. If you're in soccer, they work on the skills that are there. If you're in school and you're learning a language, they always take a little bit further in terms of your vocabulary and everything. And God is like that. He wants you to trust him. And as big as your God is, when you get to that point, it's going to go a little bit further. It's kind of like um, if you have kids, um, 
you have the little kids and, and they grow up to a certain age and you say, hey, I've got this. I can give to vice anybody that has a baby or little kids. That's an easy thing. But then your kids move into middle school and high school and you are stretched again because they're pushing the limits all the time. <clears throat> And you get through that. You could give advice on that. But then your kids at a certain point, your children become independent. And you're thinking sometimes, uh, as mom and dad, do I call them? And I say, that's a bad decision. How? And you have to let go at a certain time and trust that in what they do, they will stay close enough to what is right or sensible that they will make a good path through life. And you're stretched again. And God does that in every area of our lives. So the very first thing for me is that God is the best life coach you can have. And you have to be able to accept that he is bigger than anything that you go through. And so in Scripture, um, it says that God created us and created us for him. The Bible says that if you trust him, you will be blessed. Um, we have this picture that if there's anybody that knows us well, it's going to be God. The higher your view of God is, the more you will trust him. And um, a lot of times at the end of our service or sometime in our service uh, back in Indiana, we'll have a prayer time, and, and sometimes people will come up and, and we'll pray with them. And it is not unusual for me to pray if somebody comes forward and they have an illness or something they're wrestling with and it has to do with healing or God doing something for their body, I almost always will pray two things in the prayer I pray for that person. Number one is that God puts your body together, and there is nobody that knows your body better than God knows your body. The second thing that I always pray is if he knows you as well as we know the Bible says he does, there's nobody better that knows how to fix that body better than he does. And you can trust him when you have something that you go to him for. And so the higher your view of God, how big is your God, makes a big difference in how he will stretch you a little bit more, whatever that goal might be. The second thing that I wanted to mention is there are two tensions that I want to mention that, that I think of almost immediately when I think about being what God wants us to be. And the, well, let me give you a perfect situation. In, in the garden, the Bible says that, number one, God walked with man. There, there was just close, beautiful relationship. And the second thing we know about being in a perfect situation is that God took care of every need. How we slept, what the weather was like, um, food to eat, he was our provider. So we have this picture that when we are close to God, we are in good relationship with him. And secondly, that um, he takes care of us. What we see in the book of Genesis, if you would read through there, is that when man moves away from God, there are two things that happen. Number one is we don't feel like we need God. So we start to move away from this part of the relationship. And then we think, I can do everything I need to do. I don't need God. I can totally depend on myself. And so there is always this tension about keeping in good relationship. There is always this tension about how much can I trust God for? And you might think, it, this is just my personal view, but you might think that the hardest place to be is when you move really far from God because you stretch those bands and out here it, it would be very tough. But I think the worst part is when you're right about here and you can see where you used to be, you know what's good for you, you remember the things that were really good and healthy about being there, you knew how God took care of you, and it is not that God takes everything away from us. He's, he's not a God that controls us like robots. I mean, you're going to decide the car that you drive. You're going to decide the kind of place that you want to live. You're going to decide the kind of food that you want. I mean, he, he, he leaves so much to us, but do we depend on him? And I think when you're right there, that's the hardest stretch because I think that the further away you move, you, you get comfortable with that. Now, I, I run half marathons, hibernation stage right now, uh, and, you know, a couple months to go. Um, I don't run to compete time-wise. I run to finish. And I have some friends that, um, for me, I love a flat course. Florida would be the perfect place to run a distance because you don't have any hills. 
And, but I have friends who say, oh, I, I love that half marathon over there because you just have these steep hills that you're running up and down. I'm thinking, why would you think that way? And they say, because the pain feels so good when you push yourself. And I understand that from an athletic point of view that there's something about when you're lifting weights and, you, and you're, 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 you're pushing just a little bit further. I mean, in all the sports, there is that, that moment of pain or that time of pain. And um, they like that. And I think that the thing is, is they have been so accustomed to pain as a good thing because they know what it's doing for them and they know how their body is being stretched and it just pushes them. I think that's what happens when you move a long ways from God is that you get to a place where it just doesn't bother you anymore. You, you're so far away that it's, it's a bad place to be in because it says sometimes that God just lets you go at that point. He's, got, he's not going to be on your back. He's not going to be pushing you. He's not going to be reminding you. And sometimes it's really hard for somebody that knows everything that's right but has walked a long ways away. And so my second question is, if you're going to move closer to God, where in your life do you feel like you have pulled away from where God wants you? And the two areas to me that are big are how close do you feel to him? And number two, how much do you trust him for what he can take care of in your life? There are a couple of stories um, in the New Testament that revolve around answering a question. And uh, if you could, just move to the very last verse that, that we had so I can read this. Um, this is the one that we will uh, end with here this morning, but I want to tell you a couple of stories connected with this. Um, this is with, with some Jewish people, and, uh, and they're asked, you know, what's the most important thing to do? And if you go down to the third line, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is, love your neighbors yourself. And then it says, there is no greater commandment, singular, than these. So it's... Two different commands, but he groups them together, Jesus does when he talks about them. Um, getting to know God is experiencing him in as many different ways as you are able to. Um, my wife, um, Rita, we have, I, I don't know when we started this, but when it's a birthday or an anniversary or Valentine's Day, any occasion, we always get at least two cards for each other. The first card is racy, funny, sexy. It's whatever just fits where we are as a couple. The second card is always the serious, the wording of the card matters. You want to say just the right thing about your relationship. And, and I like that we do that because that says something to different parts of who I am, and it says something to different parts about who she is. So we have a lot of fun just being able to pick out cards to tell the other how much we appreciate the different areas. And so when God talks, or when Jesus talks in this verse, and he says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, he's talking about different ways, and love your neighbor as yourself. So here are three different contexts, this very same story, but I, I'm going to challenge you with these because one of these three may be the way that God will challenge you to be closer to him. Here's the first one. Um, by the way, in these stories, two of the three, or all three, are from people who live religious lives, <clears throat> and they are very picky about doing everything just right. They measure their life. They, they are so disciplined in everything that they do. And so, as they are asking, Jesus sees that. And two of the three ask this question, which is really unusual. How do I know I will inherit eternal life? How do I know for sure I'm going to be going to heaven? Now, that, that seems like if you ask that question, this might not be the answer you get. But they ask, how do they get to heaven? And Jesus says, well, you need to love the Lord your, your uh, God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Now, the... Uh, the first one is a religious teacher, and he's listening to that. He's, he's worried about every little thing that he needs to do. And he hears that verse, and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, strength. That didn't really raise any red flags. But love your neighbors yourself, that raised a red flag. And so he says to Jesus, who's my neighbor? 
And Jesus says, let me tell you a story. The Good Samaritan. He says, there was a man who was laying close to the road, and he had been beaten up, he was wounded, he was bleeding, he was left there to die. And one of the religious teachers comes by and sees him and thinks, oh, that person's unclean, and I don't want to be by him. And so it says when he gets to him, he goes around him and doesn't stop to do anything. He says a second person came by, and this was a Levite. This was a holy man, had to do everything to keep himself pure. If he would touch that person, if he would try and help that person, he had to go through a cleansing process at the end of that because you didn't touch something that was sick or that was hurt like that. So he comes up, and this Levite, the holy man, he walks over to the side and goes by. And then he says the third person that came by is a Samaritan. Now understand that to a Jewish person back then, the Samaritans were the race right next to the Jewish land. And and it didn't matter to the Jewish person what you said about them because they were unacceptable. They were a step down than a Jew. You didn't have to talk to them. If you did talk to them, you could say whatever you wanted about them. You could make fun. And a lot of times when the Jews went towards Samaria, they literally would walk around this area to not even walk in their land. And so here is an example where the Samaritan comes up, and it says he stopped. He picks this man up. He puts him on his donkey. He takes him to a, an inn, and he gives the person money. He says, take care of this man. Take care of his medicines. Take care of everything. Here's money. Here's money for him to stay here. I'm going to be coming back the next number of days when I stop by again. I'll pick up the tab if you have to spend any more than that on him. And then Jesus says this. He says, who was the better neighbor? They all knew the answer to this. It would have been hard for a Jewish person to know the answer to this. And what it was saying was this, is we can obey all the little religious rules from love the Lord your God in this way and this way and this way and this way, but if your Christianity, if your religion is just about obeying rules and you don't care about the people on the outside, you're not loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. If you really love the Lord your God, you're going to care about the people around you in the ways that you can care about them best. And it may be that at work somebody's just not themselves on a certain day, and, and maybe the only thing you do to somebody like that is say, hey, do you need somebody to talk to? Is there anything that I could pray about? And don't pry, don't push, but try and open a door that says I care about you. And, and it could be a lot of different ways to caring to somebody that's homeless or somebody that's going through a divorce or somebody that's struggling with finances, but it's the whole idea that your religion is not loving the Lord your God with your whole mark, heart unless you are doing this. Some of you will move closer to God simply because you said, give me opportunities to let people outside of my circle know that I care about them. So for the goals that I've set for myself, I have some goals that are just for me. Reading through the Bible and doing some things with prayer, that's my first goal. My second goal is how do I connect with others to strengthen them or let them encourage me. My third goal is how can I do something to help somebody else? How can I serve? How can I be open to that? Okay, that's first story. Is loving the Lord your God means it's outside of just who you are. The second story is the man we call the rich young ruler. And this guy comes up to Jesus, and the disciples think he's great because he's wealthy. And he says to Jesus, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus says, all right, do you covet your neighbor's things? No. Um, committed adultery? No. He goes through a couple of the Ten Commandments. And the guy says, well, I've done all those things. Jesus is setting him up because then he says, all you have to do is sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Now, I'm sure he hated the poor. The poor didn't know how to take care of their money. The poor didn't make any money. Why would I give it to the poor? And it says that he walked away. In this example about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, Jesus is saying this. He is saying, not only do you worry about outside your life, but you need to be willing to let God walk through your life. In this man's case, it was his finances. You might say, hey, my marriage is good. Things with the kids are good. But work, 
I, I need to work this out on my own. Or finances, I'm really struggling. And what Jesus is saying here is you're not loving the Lord your God with all your heart if you're keeping certain areas of your life away from God. Third story, same verse. And this one is um, one where the religious leaders are trying to trap him. This, this to me is my favorite one because I think something happens in this story that lets us see that when we try and move closer to God, he so appreciates that that he begins to affirm things in your heart that you're doing the right thing and you feel drawn to it even more. So they ask him what the greatest commandment is. And if you go to the last screen for just a second, he, he speaks in Jewish language. He says, hear, O Israel, um, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, that was an important statement because for Israel, surrounded by the Romans and the Greeks and the Babylonians and the pagan empires and Egyptians, they had all had uh, rows of gods, a god that helped in war, a god that helped in, in sex, a god that helped in the crops, and, and all of the different things. They had separate gods. And he says, our God is one. That, that's exactly what a Jewish person would want to hear. They only have one God, and that God is over everything in our lives. And then if you get to the very end, if you go to the next screen, after he says that, he says, the second is this, love your neighbors yourself. There is no greater command than these. When he goes a little bit further, something happens in that interchange that it is rare in Scripture that you read anything like this. But one of the teachers was looking at him and said, he compliments Jesus. At this point, usually people get upset, and they don't want Jesus to talk to them anymore. But he says um, to him, he says, you, oh, you can finish the sermon now. <laughs> he says, you um, are right, Master. You have said right. Now, what's your first name? Terry? Terry? Okay. I'm guessing Jesus would be about for me to tarry away from whoever he's speaking to. So it's eye contact he's got with this guy that said, what you said is right. You're, you are right on in saying that, and, and you have spoken very accurately. There was a time when Jesus was with his disciples, and he wanted to know how much they understood about who he was. And he said, who do people say that I am? And um, when he did that, they gave the standard answer, oh, you're John the Baptist, oh, you're a prophet. But Simon Peter, Peter says, no, no, you are, you're really the Messiah. And Jesus says, Peter, you were right, but you didn't come up with that on your own. That's something that God helped you to see. God will work in our lives. He'll help you to see what you need to see. It was a very um, tender but strong moment. And I think that's what's happening between me or between Jesus and this one teacher. Nobody compliments Jesus as a rule. He compliments Jesus in front of all of his teacher of the law friends. And Jesus looks back at him. I've tried to play this thing over my mind a hundred times, a hundred times. And he says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. I can see this, Jesus just eye contacting this guy, just like he does with us sometimes. And Jesus many times talked in parables. He, he would say something, and nobody else would understand it. And then he would tell his disciples. He said, they're not ready to understand it. It won't make sense to them. They're not ready to move on. But this is what that story meant. And so a lot of times what Jesus said was hidden or it was cloaked. And to me, there was a second meaning when Jesus is looking at this guy and saying, you are not far from the kingdom of God. To me, for a guy to say that, that never, he ne Jesus never hears that, I think he might also be saying, you aren't far from me. And the truth of the matter is, is when we have a desire to get closer to Jesus, you will start to see things in your life pop out. And you're thinking, I'm living a little bit too close to that edge or over that edge, and I need to move back. 
Or I have a passion for doing this, but I walk by it every day and I'm not doing this. Or I have people that really around me, I just need to stop and think about their lives. I remember one time I was playing basketball when I was early in the ministry. Just quick story here, and I got mad at the ref. I thought the game he called was terrible. And, and I let him know it during the game. And I'm the pastor of the church, and I'm on the basketball team, and I went up afterwards, and I said, hey, I, I pastor at the church, and my attitude was terrible. I am sorry. And uh, he's, for, for two or three minutes, he started to tell me that his marriage was on the rocks, and his wife was going through things and not at home with him anymore. And in that moment, I'm thinking, you know what? What's more important, that his mind was totally on the game or that somebody says, I'll pray for you. I don't even know all the answers. But I think sometimes God will surprise us when we show a little bit of attention to people that may be ones that we would easily overlook. Um, I'm asking you to think of one or two things that you could say to God on this day. Lord, help me with this goal, whatever it might be, and, and with this, one or two things, so that by the time I get to the end of 2020, I will know that I have moved a little bit further along. I want you just to pray with me, if you will. Father, I'm praying for every young person and every man and every woman that is sitting here right now. Help us to know that there's something about us moving closer to you that draws you closer to us. <clears throat> and it's not about us always achieving, but it's about what you can achieve in us the closer we are to us and that comfort zone. And will we be stretched in life? Absolutely, in so many different ways. But if we believe that our God is a big God, who can handle whatever we're going through, and we will trust that, I believe you will bless us. I believe that you will help us to see things that we've never seen before. And I believe every year can be a stronger year than it was the year before. Even if it seems a little bit scary of a step, help us always to be willing to move in your direction and say, God, you know, you were right. It's better to be closer to you than farther from you. Help our prayers to be found true in you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Church Experience Online. Please don't forget to check out the website if you'd like to get more connected, learn more, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially. You're now going to hear a Church Experience Worship original song, and we hope this gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned today. can move mountains, your strength surrounding us. We can move mountains.